<clears throat> Thank you, Cynthia. And um, uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, the microphone doesn't really work for me that much. May I, may I come out from, can everyone hear me okay if I walk around a little bit? Um, it is a, a double delight to be here. And, um, well, triple delight, maybe quadruple delight, I'm not sure. Um, and for things, reasons I didn't expect. For one, um, I've seen some folks that uh, I've known for a long time, and one in particular, Gwen Ward. Where's Gwen? Where'd she be? Oh, that's right, where she usually is, behind a camera. I've known Gwen, I used to work at... Uh, Cape Fear Museum, formerly New Hanover County Museum of Lower Cape Fear, and um, gosh, she before DVD, she was there with the video cameras. She has always just been such a, a, a solid museum person and history person. And uh, hadn't, I, Gwen, I don't think I've seen you since I went to Whiteville, the Museum of Forestry, 13 years ago. So what a delight to see you, uh, David Stallman. Uh, fine historian in his own right and uh, published author and my longtime museum friend uh, Al Potts uh, who came over from Rich Lands in Onslow County where he used to be the director of the Onslow County Museum. Uh, so it, of course that's, that's, that's the first thing that was a surprise to see all these familiar faces. Um, secondly, uh, Tim mentioned about the Batson Canoe. Now, I did start in the museum profession <clears throat> at the North Carolina Marine Resources Center, uh, now known as the North Carolina Aquarium. I think they made a wise decision in changing the name uh, from North Carolina Marine Resources Center to NC Aquarium. We actually had a reporter come down when I was working there from 1979 to 1980 who uh, asked uh, one of my colleagues, how long have you been in the Marines? Uh, <laughs> I, I know, that's, that's, that's a true story though. Um, but Bats and Canoe, that was the second exhibit I did in my career. Uh, I mean, really, and, to see, and I knew that it had made its way back here. I mean, this place didn't even, I mean, the building of course existed, but the organization and all uh, must have just been forming. It was nothing like it is today. And so, there, they, you know, uh, young Batson, and he was a young man then, I think he was about 12 years old or so, found this very unique dugout canoe. And um, they didn't know what to do with it, so they took it to the Marine Resources Center because they deal with stuff like that. And since I was uh, the only uh, person with a history background on the staff, they said, do something with it. So um, my second exhibit was, it was actually outdoors and it was roped off and um, much different display, but, that, but the bats and canoe itself actually was the essence of my second museum exhibit. The Fort Fisher Hermit was the first, but the bats and canoe led to my third exhibit down there. How do you build a dugout canoe? And that's another story in itself. So that was the, the double delight for being here. But really the big delight, is um, seeing all of you all as a group. Now I'm here to tell you, um, you've got a lot going for you here. This is a robust group. There's not a county or a town in this state, probably this country, that wouldn't be just as proud as they could be to have this number of people. When Cynthia asked me to be here, and, and you know, honestly, most groups that I speak to like this are maybe 10 to 20 people tops. And when she told me, oh, there'll be about 80 to 100 people, I'm thinking, honestly, Cynthia, yeah, really, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and what always happens, people always tell me that, oh, there's going to be, oh, we have a, and then I'll get there and there will like, be, you know, like a half a dozen people there. And then the person that booked me will come up apologetically and say, well, you know, we have something going on in town tonight, or, I mean, you know, it's always, right out, and that's why they always, always do, do that sort of thing. But um, you all are alive and well, and you are doing great things here uh, for Topsail Island and for regional history in general, and, uh, and I just salute you. I just wish um, I could get some of your DNA in all of the history groups that are around North Carolina. Now, you notice on your table, I did leave a couple of things, knowing that you all are lifelong learners, 
And uh, this is kind of a quaint presentation, as you can see. It's a history presentation, so we're using a historic machine here. I know that you all are familiar with the slide projector, the real slide projector. I know that's very quaint, and my younger colleagues, they, they laugh at me all the time, but um, at least I will not have a computer screen pop up in the middle of the presentation that I'm going to have to stop and say, wait a minute, let me, you know, do this sort of thing. Uh, and the other uh, quaint part is that a bookmarker, and, you know, because I know I can look at this crowd, uh, good-looking young crowd, I might add, um, but old enough to appreciate a bookmarker and a good book. And this little instrument that some of our young folks don't really know what to do with, <laughs> a pencil. Use it well and think about the North Carolina Museum of Forestry in Whiteville uh, over in Columbus County, and I'll talk about that a little bit, a little bit more. I had bookmarkers, I think, for every seat in the house. I shortchanged a couple of back tables on the pencils. I ran out of pencils. So uh, my only advice is that when your neighbor's not looking, if you really want a pencil, <laughs> just, just slip over there and get it. I do have this one extra one that I, I, I use for a prop. <clears throat> okay, well, we didn't come here to talk about all of this, but we did anyway. We came here to talk about why we're called Tar Heels. Now, I know what you're saying, well, again, what's the day? Today's the first day of the ACC tournament. I mean, with this kind of crowd, I'm surprised, you know, it's just great. But the only reason I bring that up because a lot of people think we're called Tar Heels because of the basketball team in Chapel Hill. <laughs> it is not true. The name comes from what we're going to talk about today. It gets a lot of, um, a, a, a lot of people think that the name Tar Heel was coined uh, during the Revolutionary War when uh, Cornwallis was going from Wilmington up to Yorktown and he went through some of our, our muddy, uh, dark rivers, and his redcoats came out with what looked like tar on their heels. Some people think that uh, it was in the Civil War where the North Carolina boys up there, first Manassas or first Bull Run, held their ground and uh, like they had tar on their heels. There's a reverse to that story. If you're from Virginia, supposedly the Virginians say that North Carolina's retreated, and they hollered at them, we're going to take some of your tar and put it on your heel so you'll stick next time. So it just depends on whether you're coming from North Carolina or Virginia as to which version of that. Supposedly, the great man himself, Robert E. Lee, wrote, God bless the Tar Heel Boys. That all might be true, and, uh, and it certainly was deserved, <clears throat> but there's no, like, smoking gun where... Lee is writing Davis, uh, God bless the Tar Heel boys that I know of. But I'm sure that the term Tar Heel was being thrown around a lot before the Civil War. But it wasn't, that might have been what they used it to coin, to, to, to tag people from North Carolina. But why were they actually called Tar Heels? And so you still, I still continually hear new st stories about why we're called Tar Heels. And I will tell you this, and then we'll get into the essence of the program here. My Johnny Depp story on why we're called Tar Heels. Now I can tell, he's looking at me right now and said, what in the world's Johnny Depp got to do with why we're called Tar Heels? <laughs> Indulge me for a second. About three years ago, I was camping over in Kentucky. Johnny Depp's from Kentucky, believe it or not. You know, big, international, famous movie star has lived all over Kentucky. And we're camping close to a small town that he grew up in. And uh, I didn't go there for that reason. Went there for a good cup of coffee that morning um, and to explore, you know, get out and explore the area a little bit. Chamber of Commerce lady said, oh, well, there's a coffee shop right around the corner there. And it's run by Johnny Depp's cousin. And I said, oh, really? And then she tells me that he was from there and all that stuff. Well, we got to go have a cup of coffee over at Johnny Depp's cousin's place. And uh, so we went over. And he didn't have a shingle outside that said coffee by Johnny Depp's cousin or anything like that. Uh, but the guy that ran it definitely was a Depp. You know, he had that kind of look about him that Johnny Depp has. 
kind of a quiet fella, you know. And I went in there, uh, minding my own business, got a cup of coffee, and, um, uh, and finally, he, his curiosity came up, and uh, he asked me, um, uh, where was I from? And I told him North Carolina. And then totally volunteered, oh, well, I was in North Carolina a couple of years ago, and I found out why you're called Tar Heels. And I thought, well, this, guy, this is going to be rich. You know, coming from Johnny Depp's cousin. I said, okay, why were we called Tar Heels? And um, he said, I, and I was in Chapel Hill. I'll tell you where we're going with this right off the bat. And he said, somebody in Chapel Hill told me a Tar Heel was the hind leg of a goat. So I said, uh-uh, that's not exactly it. There happened to be a little ladies club meeting in there. I ended up giving an impromptu uh, a presentation on why North Carolinians are called Tar Heels. But so there's, yeah, I mean, you'll hear just a million different reasons. But it all comes back to these trees, longleaf pines, which used to really just cover the entire coastal plain of North Carolina. The longleaf pine, and we still have some longleaf pine today, even though a lot of the pines that you see in the coastal plain of North Carolina have been replaced by loblolly pines or slash pines or, or other types of trees. The longleaf pine uh, was rich in resin. Talk about that in a second. When you're walking around, and you might probably not on the island here, but if you're on the mainland walking around in the woods, every now and then you might run into a tree that looks like it looks like it's been diseased or something. Uh, but not really. The tree actually had been scarred many, many years ago. If you look close, you can see in the top of this a little ridge. That's where they would take a hack such as that, and I have a little display up here um, I'll point to in, at the end of the program, and I'd invite you to come up and take a look at it. They would strip the bark off the tree, and you can see the little hack marks up there, just like this man is doing. And the reason that he was doing that, and the reason that he was doing it to a lonely pine tree, was to get this stuff, resin. The rich, not, not to be confused with rosin, that's another part of the story, but it's not a tomato tomato situation. This is resin, and this is rosin here. And I'll talk a little bit more about where that comes from. But that's what that fellow was after in stripping the bark off of that lonely pine tree was to get to this rich resin. Why did he want that? Well, naval stores. They called it naval stores because the production of tar and pitch and rosin and turpentine were all key ingredients to keeping the massive, the innumerable wooden sailing fleets of the 18th and the 19th century afloat. I mean, it was really, really uh, key to uh, a seafaring nation's survival to have a, a reliable source uh, for this. It was used, all those products were used in almost every aspect of shipbuilding. When the British, which of course their power, their economic and their uh, military power uh, was, was based on their navies, when they got to North Carolina, I mean, they must have just, tears must have come to their eyes because most of their naval stores at that time were coming from Northern Europe. And they looked at North Carolina and saw this look like an endless supply of trees that could provide the tar, pitch, and turpentine some historians have actually likened the importance of naval stores to the British Empire to the importance of oil to the United States today. That, that, that important. So they really thought that they had, you know, uh, uh, stumbled into um, a, a Garden of Eden from a turpentine standpoint. Uh, there are a couple of different ways to make, actually two different distinct ways to make turpentine and naval stores and tar. And the most ancient way is the tar pool. That's where they would go out, they would find dead wood laying around, preferably again from the longleaf pine. They would <clears throat> make a circle, or it might be uh, a different type of shape, more of an oblong shape. They would cut, uh, they would uh, pile the sticks, the dead wood, up, around, uh, the, around the circle, all heading downward, 
as you can see, there's a cavity in the bottom of this, and then that cavity would be also connected with a pipe or a trough going downward to a collection pit that you can see in the bottom of this drawing. They would pile it just as high as they possibly could. Now this obviously is in a colonial photograph because there were no colonial photographs. This is Sampson County in 1890. I mean, they were still doing this as long ago as 1890. They'd pile the wood, the dead wood, just as high as they possibly could. They would bunt it around to get a, a really kind of like a good Dutch oven sort of cooking effect there. And then they would put some dirt on the top of it. They might brace it up with some logs around the bottom. And they would start cooking this thing. And, and the temperature would get uh, hot. And it would start loosening up this frozen resin that was in this dead wood. And slowly but surely, black, rich tar would start dribbling out. Uh, it's incredible how many of these tar kilns are, if you're from around here, tarkles, or around the area, you still find them out in the woods, uh, not like you're seeing here, but remnant, remnants of them. Um, the other way of producing naval stores was to remember the chap that we saw stripping the bark off of the tree and getting the resin. They would take the raw resin and they would take it <clears throat> to a still, very much like other types of stills that you would find out in the woods around North Carolina, except these stills were turpentine stills. This was a great innovation in the early uh, 19th century. They would go out around this time of year. In fact, uh, this is uh, uh, coming up with the change of the seasons, the really heavy lifting work, which would be stripping the bark off of the trees, cutting a notch, down at the bottom of that, which was called the box. If you hear of somebody talking about boxing a tree, they're not talking about going out with gloves and hitting a tree uh, just because they're, they're, they're feeling frisky. Uh, they're talking about cutting a notch down in the bottom below this area that's stripped out. And the area that's stripped out, I love the colorful names, is the cat face. It's generally referred to as a cat face. They would do that heavy cutting and, uh, and stripping right during this time of the year, uh, right while, while it was still uh, cool enough that they could do it and it wouldn't be quite as strenuous, but right before the sap really started flowing. And then when it got warmer, the sap would start flowing and they would come back and they would dip out the resin. They would put it in a, in a, small, in a, a small container, put that in a larger barrel, Take the barrel across the creek, not to grandma's house, but to a waiting turpentine still out in the woods. Now, just soak up this photograph for a second. Again, this is from the Sampson County around 1890. And that was long past the heyday of this industry in North Carolina. Nevertheless, here's the turpentine still out probably in the area cut in the woods and um, the turpentine barrels or tar barrels or other products were you could walk across the entire yard without without your foot touching the ground. Imagine scores of these turpentine stills up and down the North Carolina coastal plain. Every county in this area were some of the leading naval stores producers. Onslow County, Pender County, and of course Pender County was part of New Hanover County until as recently as 1875. Columbus County, where the Forestry Museum is located, Brunswick County, Sampson County, of course, some, some of these photographs are from, from the late 19th century. But not just the southeastern part of the state, really throughout the entire coastal plain. The technology, the technology at that particular time was helping fuel this. Part of that technology were the steamboats that first made their appearance on the Cape Fear River with the Prometheus back in 1817, which were uh, improved and uh, conditioned as the 19th century wore on. The flat bottom steamboat proved to be a perfect instrument of transportation for our 
naturally shallow rivers in eastern North Carolina. And almost every river had numerous little docks on it where they would pick up a barrel or two or more of some of the naval stores. The train came into play, and this was very important in the 1840s. The, of course, the Wilmington and Weldon Railroad, supposedly the first longest um, uh, railroad in the world at the time, 161 miles from here to uh, Weldon and then points north up in Virginia. Uh, that really opened up part of the parts of North Carolina that were virtually uh, inaccessible uh, because naval stores, as you probably gathered, these barrels of naval stores were very heavy. The roads around here, um, mostly sand, um, you can still find yourself stuck on one of our sand roads. If you don't watch out, if you go off the road uh, around here, uh, I hope you haven't had that experience, but it's still possible. So you can imagine, uh, you know, the transporting of all of this material was very, very difficult. So trains opened up, uh, went beyond the rivers and opened up really the entire coastal plain to the naval stores industry. Everybody, and I mean almost everybody, seemed to be in the naval stores business, connected with it one way or the other. Every traveler's account that you read about in the early 19th and the late 18th century and letters from the area all talk about, I mean, nobody, I mean, it's hard, you're hard pressed to find anybody that's here that doesn't comment on how everybody is in this turpentining business. One fellow came through in the 1840s on a train at dusk, and he looked out his train window, probably on the Wilmington and Weldon Railroad. He looked through the coastal plain at all those pine trees that had been boxed, that the bark had been scraped off and the cat face had been formed. And riding home, he said, everybody here is doing this turpentining business, and they're all scraping the bark off the trees. And as you come through at dusk, as the sun sets in the piney woods, it almost looks like you're looking through an endless graveyard. And this photograph, you can sort of see that, how this fella might, might, might make that uh, comparison. Because indeed it does, as far as the eye can see, back in the background, where these trees have been cat-faced, and the, what light there is reflects off of them, almost looks like a lot of tombstones. As I said, every, almost everybody was in it, and this is, this is sort of the pecking order of the naval stores industry. At the top, the commission merchant. They were usually down in the ports, uh, Wilmington, uh, Newbern, uh, uh, Edenton, other, other uh, colonial and early republic ports of, um, of uh, this country. You had the dock workers, and in Wilmington, about 10% of the blacks in Wilmington were free blacks, and a lot of those uh, folks were working down at the docks. This is Wilmington after the Civil War, probably around 1875 or so, and these gentlemen are standing on the dock uh, approximately where the battleship is located today, just to kind of give you an idea of where, where they're standing. <clears throat> there were the Coopers, probably the second biggest Industry next to the production of naval stores was making the barrels to put it in. Uh, and also the um, uh, turpentine stills, the ironworks. This is Wilmington Ironworks that operated for all, uh, about 150 years down on Front Street in, in Wilmington. And of course, you know, if any industry gets big enough, you've got to get some government inspection going on, right? Well, naval stores was no different. <coughs> Because um, naval store, the, you know, taking, sometimes it was just an honest accident, and I believe that's what it was most of the time. But, you know, water could get in the barrels. Not all resin and turpentine was equal. Uh, you probably heard uh, the reference of virgin pine. That's referring to uh, longleaf pine that has been boxed, and the resin has been taken out of it for the first time which was considered the highest quality resin. Sometimes there would be trash in the barrels, trash like, uh, when I say trash, not trash trash, but like pine cones, pine needles, things of that nature. So they were weighed uh, for uh, accuracy of weight 
and they were inspected to make sure water and, uh, and, and what degree of trashiness each one of these barrels uh, had. And like I said, the Coopers, I mean, they were producing literally tens of thousands of barrels uh, locally and throughout North Carolina to uh, support the production of the naval stores. And then there were the tools. Now, this obviously is a fairly modern photograph. This is Council Tool Company, still in operation today at Lake Waccamaw. Actually, it's at Wanish. And they were the biggest producers of naval stores tools probably in the country in the late 19th century. They started uh, down uh, in our area producing these tools uh, uh, around 1886 or so. The beautiful thing about Council Tool Company is that they stamped all of their hacks. Actually, when you come over and look at uh, the display, you can take a look at this little hack and you'll see Council Tool Company is actually stamped on it. But it didn't end here in southeastern North Carolina or eastern North Carolina. Uh, I was down at the Georgia Agorama a few years ago looking at their naval stores display because that's where the industry eventually migrated to. And uh, their whole wall was filled with Council Tool Company hacks. So, and the Council Tool Company obviously doesn't make naval stores tools anymore, but they make uh, striking tools and some of the best axes and other bladed tools made right here in the USA uh, and locally. Some of the things that they were making, however, in the naval stores era were the elongated axe. That was for cutting those boxes uh, in the tree. Uh, they were making the hack, which is really the workhorse tool of the uh, naval stores uh, industry. And collection buckets, wooden buckets at first. I do not have a wooden bucket. They're extremely rare. There's one at Cape Fear Museum, but I do have a later bucket, collection bucket over here, uh, this metal bucket. And in front of that, you see a couple of dippers. And uh, I have a couple of dippers here. One that uh, is an actual dipper is stuck over in this piece of a tree that was hacked. And another one over here in a uh, container of raw resin that was actually uh, produced for me for, from a, uh, by a blacksmith over at Tryon Palace some years ago. But of course, the uh, main folks that were really directly involved in the naval stores industry were the people that were out in the woods. And most of the hands were, uh, at, at least before the Civil War, uh, were African American and following the Civil War, but not exclusively. Uh, overseers here, you can see the overseers and you can see the workers out there. Uh, and you can even see that even the dogs were involved in the naval stores industry, apparently. This all combined to make Wilmington, and this probably won't surprise you, maybe it will. By 1840, it made Wilmington, North Carolina, the largest city in the state. This is position that it was to hold for the rest of the century. It was the largest city in the state from 1840, the 1840 census, for every census right through 1900. And it started losing about a notch a year. In 1910, it was the second largest city, 1920, third largest, and so forth and so on. Uh, so it was kind of the Charlotte of its day. Not exactly, because the, well, North Carolina really didn't have any really huge cities back in the 19th century. Wilmington was indeed the largest city. And by the Civil War, the, the largest city still only had about a little over 10,000 residents in it. Then, of course, you know what happened. The war came, and um, uh, the whole landscape of the South changed. This great uh, production, this great product uh, that was the backbone of our economy, naval stores, gave way to cotton, which was more valuable to the Confederacy and easier to transport on the blockade runners that were built specifically for the purpose of bringing valuable goods uh, in and taking the cotton out. This all came to an end in Wilmington, but Wilmington was the last major port to be closed at the fall of Fort Fisher and just celebrated, the uh, um, I think it was the 147th or 48th uh, anniversary of the two battles of Fort Fisher. Uh, this is the, uh, a little rendition, of course, of the second battle on the, uh, January the 15th, 1865, when the fort fell uh, after a combined uh, Union naval attack uh, for those three days in January of 65, uh, January 13th, 14th, and 15th. So the war's over, and the first thing that we want to do, of course, is get back to business as usual. And again, you can see the countless 
containers, the countless barrels of naval stores, again, about where the battleship North Carolina is located today. Um, and this is, uh, again, a late uh, 19th century uh, photograph that was uh, taken uh, after, after the Civil War. However, things were starting to change in the naval stores industry. There were several things that were happening that were eventually going to cause its demise in North Carolina. The first was ship technology was changing. Uh, ships were, not, were no longer made exclusively out of wood. They were made out of a whole variety of materials. The Civil War itself brought the use of metal uh, in shipbuilding uh, to the fore. Uh, so, you know, the technology of shipbuilding was changing. There was just less of a demand for the naval stores industry. Other products, uh, chemical products, petrochemical products, uh, were taking the place of some of the products uh, that had been pr uh, formerly produced uh, through the naval stores industry. But in North Carolina, the main reason that naval stores uh, was going away was because of the decimation of the longleaf pine forest. You can see with this map, 1700 to 1900. 1700 being the shaded space that you see, uh, and that's about where the long, about the extent of the longleaf pines. Actually, I have found some evidence of pines that were used in the naval stores industry even a little further west than this. By 1900, you just had these little patches that were left, and in many ways, are some of the same little patches that are that are left today. As you can see, remember those first photographs that we saw those men out in the woods and how thick the woods are? Uh, this obviously, this is in the 20th century. You can tell by the dress of the man over to the right. Uh, but look how sparse that, that forest is and how, how cleaned out it has become. Naval stores, the trees were going away, but <clears throat> there were still some naval stores industry left in this country but the men had to follow the pine trees. And so they picked up their buckets and they picked up their dippers and they headed south. They first went into South Carolina and then eventually into Georgia and Northern Florida. We tried a brief revival in the 1950s up in the Weymouth Woods around Southern Pines, Pinehurst area. And Weymouth Woods, by the way, if you really wanna see a nice stand of longleaf pines, we've got patches of them around here you could find them even here in Onslow and uh, Pender County. Uh, down in New Hanover County, if you ever go to Huma Cray Park, that's almost all longleaf pines over there. Uh, but if you want to see like a really good, solid longleaf pine forest, uh, take a trip over to uh, Weymouth Woods, which is near Southern Pines. Uh, and that's where they tried to revive the industry in the 1950s, as you can see from this Durham uh, newspaper, but uh, a little uh, too little, too late. However, you can still find remnants of the naval stores industry if you just look around. To begin with, there are place names like Rosendale. It didn't get that name just because of Miss Rosendale living there. It was because it was producing rosin. And I don't think I explained about rosin. When you produce turpentine, when you take that raw sap and put it through a turpentine still, the byproduct of that is rosin. Tar Heel, what, I mean, you got to have a town called Tar Heel. And what I love about Tar Heel, I go through this town all the time on my, uh, going to Raleigh, is that very modest little street sign. I've noticed in the last, when I first started talking and, and exploring naval stores about 25 years ago, I mean, I grew up around here and it was never, I, I, ne I didn't know anything about it. And very few people knew anything about it as it turned out. And uh, it seems like there's been like almost uh, a growing, a rising tide of interest in naval st in, in Tar Heels. Maybe it is because of the basketball team. I don't know. But the folks over here at the little city of a uh, little town of Tar Heel uh, finally got the idea that mm, this might be a marketable thing. So they uh, went from this street sign to this street sign. <laughs> you know, I can almost hear. The city fathers at the meeting, you know, we really got to do something about that street sign, you know. I say we put a foot with tar on it. Yes, that's a great idea. Artwork, I like this watercolor of a turpentine steel. 
You'll find various types of artwork around. You'll find even a few people. This fellow has passed away. His name is Aubrey Shaw. He was a teacher over in Bladen County. And uh, he actually, and he did not, he wasn't involved in the naval stores industry, but he was old enough to know men that were. And when he got old enough, he had a little piece of property over there. Uh, he called it Teaberry Plantation and actually uh, recreated a little bit of naval stores activity himself. This fella, his name's Horace Butler, is very much alive. Uh, a friend of mine saw him just a couple of days ago. He's 94 years old. Uh, he uh, has uh, his claim to fame is that he was he rode on the last uh, lumber raft down the Cape Fear River uh, in the 1950s, and he has the damn records to uh, to prove it. Uh, and Mr. Butler is still going strong. He uh, knows a lot about naval stores, uh, not from personal experience, but from his own. Uh, just, <clears throat> excuse me, knowledge of people that were uh, involved in it. And you can see in the foreground, he used to be quite a collector of Naval Stores tools, which he very generously uh, would either give or, or sell at a nominal price to museums like the Cape Fear Museum. And then there are other folks like Hardy Parker over in Chinkapin, who owns a nice piece of property uh, that um, has uh, produced also, I mean, I guess these guys, these tools were, uh, plentiful enough that, you know, he's found a lot of them on, on the property that he owns. One of the most interesting things that Hardy found about four years ago, uh, we were having a pretty bad drought around here, and the Northeast Cape Fear River that flows up through Chinkapin was almost uh, dried up and popped out a barrel, uh, or a former barrel of rosin, an entire barrel. This is the two halves of it. It broke in half. He gave the Forestry Museum one half of it. You can see that um, roll of duct tape on the other half to kind of get a perspective of how large it is. You can travel around the state and see all sorts of Naval Stores displays. I mean, it really does seem like it's, cut, uh, it's caught on. The Rankin Museum of American Heritage in Ellerby, up in Peach Country of all places, has one of the two known turpentine stills that I know of in North Carolina. I've got to believe there's another one out there in some barn somewhere that escaped World War II's scrap metal drive that's still waiting for the Forestry Museum to get its hands on it. Uh, Turnbull Creek over in Bladen County uh, has the other uh, naval stores, uh, the turpentine still that I know about. Um, and this one came from Onslow County, actually, Al, I found out uh, fairly recently. So those are the only two, uh, and this, again, is another great field trip if you happen to be over in Bladen County. It uh, goes right over to Elizabethtown and the uh, Cape Fear River. Um, this is familiar to you, isn't it, Al? This is Onslow County Museum over in Richlands. They have a, a, I mean, I can't tell you how thick, if you'll pardon the pun, Naval Stores was in Onslow County, and uh, they give a lot of attention to that over at the Onslow County Museum in Richlands. If you haven't been over there, I'd highly recommend that. And then Weymouth Woods that I mentioned to you earlier, great stand of longleaf pines, but they also have uh, an interpretive center that talks about, uh, see, Tar Heels and Turpentine. You just can't, cannot get away from it. You get out of the state, go down to uh, Perryville, uh, Florida, and if you go into Perryville, their, their uh, entrance sign says uh, Perryville, Florida, or, or Perry, Florida, uh, the capital of the longleaf pine, which just shows you how little they get out of that town. I mean, for anybody to say that they're the capital of longleaf pine, I think we could take issue with them on that. But the Able Stores industry migrated down there, and uh, they have a wonderful diorama. And again, this is kind of old school museum stuff, but I've got, I've got to love dioramas. And then the uh, Georgia Agarama, they actually do something that, to my knowledge, they're the only ones that do it once a year, and we're coming up on that time of year in April. They actually have a turpentine still at the Georgia Agarama. Uh, it's all about, uh, it's kind of an open air farm, homestead, agricultural museum, and part of it is naval stores, and they have a turpentine still that they actually fire up uh, once a year, and it's usually around April or so. Down in Georgia, in Waycross, Georgia, their Southern Forest Whirl, they have an excellent um, they have an excellent collection of hurdy cups and naval stores tools. But what they really have that I want, and this is a total diversion, and I know we're running out of time here, but I've, I've just got to introduce you 
to the really interest, one of the most interesting exhibits I've ever seen and really speaks to just really what is inside of a tree. This rather normal looking section of a tree was actually hollowed out and back in the 1960s or so there was a dog that was chasing a varmint who chased the This was a good dog. I'm here to tell you this. This was a good dog. This is the kind of dog if you're hunting you want this kind of dog. He was chasing this varmint and he was so intent on getting that varmint that he went right through that hollow tree, and guess what? He got stuck there, and he passed away there. I know. There's a, there's a silver lining to the story. He got stuck there. He passed away there, but the tannic properties of the inside of that tree, mummified dog. Now, really, I should have taken these slides out because I forgot this was a luncheon situation. <laughs> but, well, with your permission, I'll show you the next slide. Meet Stucky. <laughs> Stucky, and I, they, they, they did a naming contest for him down in Georgia. And Stucky was the name that they, they came up with. You can still see the determination on that dog's face. <laughs> Coming at you, I'm telling you what, that varmint, whatever it was, was a lucky varmint to get away from Stucky. But you know where you really can find all about this is over here at this little museum in Columbus County in Whiteville, North Carolina, called the North Carolina Museum of Forestry. We just finished a $2 million renovation. We're very happy about that. This is the way the outside of the museum looks. You can see one of Peter Wolf Toss famous Whispering Giant statues. He came over and carved one for us and one of the folks over in Buckhead. That's another story for another day. You can see the museum after the renovation there. And we have a tree trail out back, the North Carolina Tree Trail. I would invite all of you to come out and, uh, individually or in uh, groups or if you want to get a big old field trip together with the Topsail Island Historical Society, just let me know and uh, we'll treat you good over there. We know how to treat folks. We are working on our um, core exhibit, The Forest Our Home, uh, which we are almost uh, complete with the design. And I just wanted to give you a little, a little peek into the future. Right now we have The Forest Journey, a traveling exhibit that was put together by the Franklin Institute uh, up in Philadelphia, and Flashback, an African-American exhibit about Mac Munn, who was a, a black photographer who operated around East Arcadia. Those are temporary exhibits that we have now, but we're working on this exhibit, we're almost finished with the design of it, working with a group called VSNR uh, out of New Jersey. And we also have, because we do love naval stores, we have what I have termed the Naval Stores Experimental Station. We actually have a piece, we don't own it, but a man by the name of Albert Shaw, I think there's a photograph of Albert. This actually is our box uh, tree. I'm, I'll show you a picture of Albert in a second. He allowed us, uh, he's got a, his, his, Albert Shaw lives in Bladen County over in Clarkton, and his family's been on this property for about 200 years, and <clears throat> it's just littered with former Tar Kill or Tar Kill sites, uh, Tar Kiln sites. It also has numerous uh, trees on it that have been boxed and uh, have tried to heal themselves, like you saw some of those uh, trees in the, in the first photographs. And Albert's really into history and really into naval stores. And he allowed me and a volunteer of mine to box one of his longleaf pine trees. This longleaf pine is about 100 years old. We cored it. And we did that actually. We did this side the old-fashioned way. Um, we actually took an axe and we took, it, we took that hack that's standing up on top of that chest. And we did this. It was myself and a volunteer and Albert and another fellow who happened to uh, just arrive on the scene to watch us. Um, it took four grown men two hours to do that little bit. All I can say is we really have grown soft over the last hundred years. So we did the other side because they would often box two sides of it as well as go up the tree. The other side looks a lot better, didn't it? You might think, wow, that first box, they really got a lot of experience. Not exactly. We used a chainsaw with this. <laughs> 
All I can say is, if those old guys that had chainsaws, they would have used them too. Uh, because if you've ever tried to cut into a living green pine tree, we didn't really know what we we're doing, I admit it. And, uh, and it, it's a lot of work. These guys knew what they were doing. They knew exactly, they kept their tools probably a lot better than we kept ours. And, uh, and it, would, it would take a couple of guys, like 10 minutes, what it took four guys in the 21st century, about two hours to do. But uh, so we did this one with the, um, with the chainsaw. It's much nicer and neater looking. We got about the same amount of resin out of both of them. This bucket contains the resin that we got out of one of them for one season. We are in the process of building a tar In fact, the charcoal has been built, and we now have plans for um, uh, on Friday, uh, March the 29th, two weeks from tomorrow, we're going to fire up that tar kill, and we're going to see if we can actually take the dead wood that we piled up in there. It's not big like the ones you saw in the photographs. It's more of a scale model because, again, I... In the spirit of full disclosure, we do not know what we're doing. Uh, this, will, this will result in either one of three things. Either one, th these tarkles, these guys, I mean, it looks simple, but they really had to know what they were doing. Uh, you saw the people bunting stuff, you know, making it a nice tight fire. They, they, they had to build these just right to allow enough air to get in and gases to get out. If they didn't, there are actually records of explosions happening. So either one of three things is going to happen to myself and Albert and Henry, the volunteers working with us. We're either, go we're either going to blow ourselves up. We're either going to burn up all the wood to send there because the fire is going to go too fast. Or, uh, if the good Lord's willing, we might actually get a little bit of tar out of this model. Um, uh, come over and check it out yourself or check in with me. I'll let you know how... It it all comes out, or on March the, 20, uh, March the 30th, the 31st, look at your local news, and uh, <laughs> if you see of, a, of an explosion somewhere in Bladen County of undetermined origin, that probably will be it. This is Albert, this is Albert Shaw, and he's dipping, uh, this is a couple of years ago, and you can see the golden quality of the resin when it comes out of there, and this is really, this is a little jar of pure resin. What you'll see in the bucket has been sitting around for about a year and, um, and it's uh, sort of aerated and it's, it's stickier actually than it, normal, it normally is. But I tell you the best way to find out about naval stores and I would encourage you to do this and I would think that a lot of folks in here probably already do this because I know like I said you are lifelong learners and you like to get out and explore. Get out and explore. And if you find a tree that looks like this, that's got, had the bark stripped down in it, think about these guys that probably were there before you taking the bark off those trees. If you see a mound that's up in the, that's in the woods that doesn't look like it really belongs there, um, very likely that was the remnant of a tarkle or tar kiln or tarkel uh, that was built many years ago. And a lot of these remnants of a lot of these, you can tell that not only from the mound, but if you look around it, around that mound that's in the woods, and there's a little dip in it, like you can see this young man uh, standing in the dip. That dip, again, look at that dip and think about the collection pit that it was probably a part of. Because that almost surely that mound wasn't just a mound of trash or limbs that were piled up there at one time, but because of that dip, that will identify it. And another way to identify it, if you dig down into the middle of it, you'll find some charcoal just like this. And that's another thing that we've done over at the Naval Stores Experimental Station. We've excavated one of the charcoal sites uh, to see what was down in there. And we plan on doing uh, more uh, excavations because when these guys built these things, uh, they had to stay with them for a long time, like some weeks at a time. Um, great way to get out of the house. Uh, you know, can't do the dishes tonight, got to go sit with the tar kill. And, um, and so, you know, they... Human beings usually leave debris behind, so we're kind of interested to see how some of these guys might have been living out there. So with everything said and done, if we can get back to the beginning of this story, why are we called Tar Heels? Well, you'll get a lot of theories, but the bottom line is, at one time, most of the people in this state actually had tar on their heels. And I thank you all for your time this afternoon. Thank you very much.